So I'm the dad of four kids. And like all dads who uh, follow Jesus, I want my kids to follow Jesus. I want them to, to know God. I want them to love God. I want them to obey God and trust God. And that would be hard enough uh, if I were just trying to help them know God in a vacuum, right? If there were no other forces. Because, I, I mean, you know this. Uh, kids think for themselves. I guess I had some sort of Pollyannish idea as a young dad that I would just tell my kids what to think about God and morality and Christianity, and they naturally just think that way. I learned really early <laughs> that that didn't that that wasn't the case. Uh, I have uh, three daughters, and when my oldest daughter was just three years old, she was helping my wife tuck her little sister into bed, and I was traveling at th 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 this particular evening, but my wife told me that uh, Abigail, my oldest daughter, leaned in, looked at her little sister, and said, God will be with you tonight, Anna. God will be with you, which was super sweet. But then she turned to my wife and said, Mommy, I told Anna that God would be with her, and the other God will be with me. And I thought, oh no, like how did my three-year-old become a polytheist, right? I mean, she thinks for herself. It would be hard enough to help our kids know God if we were just doing it in a vacuum. But as we all know, it's not just helping them know and follow God as independent image bearers of God with their own thinking, with their own feeling. We're doing it in the context of this cultural moment. In other words, we're doing it at a time when there's all kinds of other outside pressures on the process. And all of us who are trying to disciple the next generation feel that. And that's why it's essential that we not only know what God's word teaches, uh, but we also know what's happening in the culture, what the forces of the world are doing to put pressure on the hearts and minds of, of the next generation. Uh, I was flipping pancakes one morning for my kids and my uh, uh, talking about the kind of the power that culture has. I, I, I was flipping pancakes one morning with my kids and uh, my wife put on a, a praise CD and the song was 10,000 Reasons. You know that song, Bless the Lord, Oh My Soul. And out of nowhere, my middle daughter, uh, who's one of those kids, by the way, who thinks out loud, she just pipes up out of nowhere. Hey, Daddy, is that Justin Bieber? I was like, what? Where have you heard Justin Bieber's name? We've never had a Justin Bieber song play in our home. Um, so we spanked her. I'm just kidding, we didn't do that. But you, you understand, I mean, it's just this power of culture is everywhere. If you ask my co-author, Brett Kunkel, why he uh, wanted to write a practical guide to culture, uh, he'll tell you he had five reasons. If you ask me, I'll tell you he had four reasons. His five reasons are his five kids. Uh, my four reasons are, are my four kids. Um, we have to know what's happening in the world. And I don't think I'm the only one who essentially, over the last five, 10 years, kind of feels completely discombobulated at how quickly culture has changed, how quickly things went from being unthinkable to unquestionable. Um, it's, 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 it's amazing the power that our culture has on this whole discipleship uh, process. Now, let me talk a little bit about what I mean by culture. Uh, we could take a long time to actually to define what culture is uh, and where culture comes from and, and, and why there is such a thing as culture, and that's all in the book. But, but, but let me just kind of give a, a quick, easy illustration. There's an old Chinese proverb that says, um, if you want to know what water is, don't ask the fish. Now, why wouldn't you ask the fish? I asked a group of students this, uh, several years ago, and they're like, I don't know, because fish can't talk. No, it's not because fish can't talk. It's because fish don't know they're wet. Uh, fish don't know anything other than water. And what water is to fish, culture is to us as humans. Uh, we're not living in a vacuum. We're swimming in a sea of ideas and inventions and social norms and cultural institutions and, and movies and songs and memes and television shows. And, and it becomes this kind of world that we live in. That's why when we leave one culture and go to another culture, I took my uh, uh, middle daughter to uh, the Dominican Republic a couple years ago. And as soon as we were there for just a few minutes, she looked around, she's like, Daddy, it's like a different world. And that's really the power of culture. It creates the worlds in which we live. Um, in our book, we talk about kind of two aspects of culture. Um, and going back to kind of the culture as water uh, kind of analogy. The, the, the first is uh, the cultural waves. If you've ever been at the beach, you got hit by a rogue wave, you know it, you felt it. And there's a lot of waves in our culture right now that we know, that we sense, and that we feel. For example, the LGBT issues. Uh, for example, the explosion of racial tension over the last five years. Uh, for example, uh, the, what, uh, what some uh, folks are calling the deaths from despair, the drug overdose 
overdoses, uh, the high rates of uh, suicide, the rising rates of suicide among teenagers. Uh, we could talk about even kind of affluence and consumerism. These are things that we actually feel. And we actually deal with many of those cultural waves that are prevalent in our culture today in the book. We go in, through them really specifically. But what I wanna talk about today is something else. You probably have also had the experience of being at the beach and uh, you know watching your kids in the water and you just kind of look down and you know kind of are distracted they're right there but maybe 5 minutes later you look up and they've just drifted you know 10 20 yards down the beach well what took them there it wasn't a wave it was a current it was an undercurrent and in cultures like that too, just like there are these big pounding waves that we feel that hit us from the side, what creates those waves very often are undercurrents that go unseen for a long time. And I think there have been four incredibly important cultural shifts, four incredibly important under the radar undercurrents uh, that are a big part of understanding what's happening in our culture. And they've shifted over the last several decades, and a lot of times they, they, they kind of went unnoticed at one, to one degree or another, but we're really feeling how different uh, the world is now because of these undercurrents. Let me talk about the first undercurrent. Um, I call it the drowning of truth in noise. Now, if you're a student of history, if you've studied history at all, you know that what we like to do, or what historians like to do, is to name periods of history. So you've probably studied the Enlightenment, or you know the Exploration Age, or you know the Western expansion. We like to identify periods of, of, of history. Well, our time period that we live in all we already has a name, and it's called the Information Age. Now, at some level, that's obvious, but the, the shift to the information age has been dramatic. Here's what I mean. On a daily basis, anyone getting on the internet has access to more information than all the previous centuries of the world combined. A student that you work with today will encounter more information today than a kid who lived in the 1200s would have seen during their entire lifetime. We just live in a time where we are deluged with information. Now, if you're a student of history at all, you can, you can look back and there's a parallel about how big of a deal this actually is. Uh, people talk about the Industrial Revolution, for example. It's the kind of the time period where most of the Western world went from being kind of based in farms to being based in cities. The works went from being based around homes to being based in factories. Uh, the move basically from you know agriculture to industry. And, and when we study it like it happened overnight, it didn't, it took decades, and it impacted literally every part of society. It impacted church, it impacted family, it impacted commerce, it impacted the economy. I mean, every single, people literally lost their lives who tried to resist it. I mean, th th this is just one of those forces of history that changed what it means to live in the world as we know it. Well, just as significant as that shift, from living in kind of an age of agriculture to an age of industry, we're in the middle of that shift now from an age of industry to an age of information. Now there's a lot of, a, a lot of ways this makes a difference. Let me give you the first one. The first way this makes a difference is that the age of information is the age of ideas. Now what I mean by that is uh, Solomon said that there's nothing new under the sun, and that's certainly true. What, what, what's the reality of our age is all that old stuff, all the ideas of human history about right and wrong and truth and God and morality and whatever else have been all repackaged and are constantly being repackaged and are bombarding us literally all the time. So we are, we are not only being bombarded with information, but no information is neutral. Information contains ideas. And so we're being bombarded with ideas, which brings up another aspect of it. The age of competing information becomes the age of competing ideas. That becomes the age of competing authorities. One of the great questions of this day and age, after this massive cultural shift of living in the information age, is who do I trust? Do I trust my pastor or do I trust my parent? Do I trust my peer or my professor? Or do I just forget all of them and just Google it? And of course, if I'm gonna Google it, I'm only gonna see what's on the first page of search results because no one goes to the second page. Right? So we're living in this age now that the kind of the hierarchy of authority and, and, and the hierarchy of what we consider to be trustworthy sources have been flattened out. And now anybody with a blog is an authority. Anybody with a meme or a Facebook post has something to say. Every opinion counts, we say. So what happens is 
The age of competing information is the age of competing ideas, which is the age of competing authorities. Now, how, how, how do we help kids navigate this world? Well, let me give you one more challenge of living in the age of information before I get to the antidote. Uh, and, and, and that is this, in an age where it is normal to have access to so much information, it's very tempting for this generation to confuse access to information with wisdom. The idea of what's true and what's good and what's wise. Knowing about stuff replaces knowing how to live. So how do we help the next generation navigate that challenge? We give a lot of antidotes in the book, but the first antidote, the thing that I think is the most important antidote for this generation living in an age of information is the antidote of discernment. When the Apostle Paul prayed for the church at Philippi, he prayed that, that their love would abound more and more in truth and in all discernment. Discernment is more than just knowing what's right from wrong. Discernment is knowing why something is right and why something is wrong. It's not only being able to regurgitate facts about the Bible, it's being able to think biblically about life in the world. In fact, let me give you a strategy for helping to develop discernment in the next generation. It's a strategy that was used by the two greatest educators in history, Socrates and Jesus. And they didn't have a lot in common, but what they did have in common as, as they were mentoring and walking with uh, their disciples, uh, what they were really good at was not just giving answers, but actually they were really good at asking good questions. And I think as educators, as disciplers, as family leaders, and we can help moms and dads do this as well, we have got to help them uh, ask good questions to this generation so that they're walking, not just passively uh, absorbing the information that's getting thrown at them, but that they're active listeners and they're actively engaged. I'll give you the most important question I think that we can ask this next generation. It's the question, what do you mean by that? You see, in an age of information, a lot of times what we'll find is that uh, we'll find ourselves using the same vocabulary as the culture around us, but not the same dictionary. Have you ever had a conversation like that? I was on a plane once from Colorado Springs to Atlanta, and I sat down next to this lady, and she was like, well, what do you do? And I was like, well, I work for a Christian organization. And she said, huh, I'm an atheist, prove me wrong. That's how our conversation started. This was a three-hour conversation that we had about everything from Hitler to God and evolution and everything else. And right off the bat, she was like, how can you believe in God? And of course, I've been to seminary. I know the five classical proofs for God's existence, you know, and the various versions of the cosmological argument. But somebody had taught me this strategy. And instead of just kind of jumping into answers, I just stopped and said, well, what do you mean by God? And she said, a grumpy old man with a beard in the sky who can't wait for you to do something wrong so he could strike you dead with a lightning bolt. I was like, well, good heavens, lady, I don't believe in Zeus. I don't want to defend him, right? And I found myself that had I just jumped into reasons uh, about why God exists, I would have been defending a conception of God that, that, that I, I didn't want to defend. Let me give you a couple words in our cultural moment that are really, really important to define. Certainly God is one of them. Because right now, the whole concept of God has been taken away from the idea that there's this independently, uh, you know, existent supreme being, you know, in, in, in the universe to God is whatever is the concept in our own minds. But that's not what we mean by God at all. Uh, another word, uh, the, the word truth. You know, we, we know the kind of the mantra, what's true for you is not true for me. But truth is not whatever I feel. Truth is what uh, corresponds to reality, that which best fits the world that we live in. The word freedom, that's a big one, right? Our culture thinks freedom is doing whatever you want. Well, doing whatever you want is the quickest way to become an, an addict, a slave to something. So if our definition of freedom makes us a slave, that's a terrible definition of freedom. But I'll tell you what, I think the most important word that we can define for this generation, uh, I mean, other than God, God's always the most important thing, right? Uh, but the most important thing that we can define for this generation, I think, is the word love. We live in a culture in which almost every time our students hear the word love used, it's being used in a sentimental way or a sexualized way. If, if the only thing they've ever heard about love is either kind of a strong sentimental feeling or a sexual urge, then what do we think they mean when they say that they love their fiance, they love their fiance one day, or they love their spouse, or, or when they sing I love God, or I love Jesus. 
I think one of the most important books written in history, at least for our cultural moment, is C.S. Lewis's book, The Four Loves. Because he talks about how sentimentality and sexuality, at least how we talk about sexuality, that's not even real love to begin with. And the reason this is so important is Jesus said the greatest commandment. It wasn't to think, it wasn't to believe, it wasn't to trust, it wasn't to do. The greatest commandment was to love. And if we don't even know what love means because we've been bombarded with all of this information and our students become passive absorbers of this, then how are they gonna know how to do the most important thing in the world, which is to love God, and to do the second most important thing in the world, which is to love their neighbor? So that's the first undercurrent, living in this age of information. It changes how we think, it changes how we know. Let me give you the second undercurrent. The second undercurrent that I think is really important is what uh, MIT psychologist Sherry Turkle called being alone together. Uh, Turkle's been writing on the, how technology is impacting us as people for, for, for three decades. I mean, all the way back in the 80s. Do you remember what computers were back in the 80s, right? Ginormous calculators. And back in the 80s, Turkle wrote a book in which she saw where computers were going and she made a prediction. She said computers wouldn't just be a place um, where we go do calculations, it would actually be a place where we go live. She predicted that in the 80s. I mean, that was before Al Gore gave us the internet, right? In the 90s, she wrote a second book. Now this is after uh, chat rooms, but before social media. She said the computer is not just a place where we're gonna go live, it's gonna be a place where we go explore alternative lives, where we explore alternative identities. Boy, that's more true than ever. Well, I, I, I read those two books in um, uh, seminary, and I remember thinking how optimistic she was about these developments. I remember, for example, reading her second book and her saying that she thought it was fantastic that a lonely 65-year-old man could be an 18-year-old woman on the internet, if that made him happy. And she thought this was just great. Well, I didn't uh, see any other books from her until 2011. And that's when she wrote her third book. And the title of the third book says it all. It's called Alone Together. And in that book, when I started reading it, first thing I noticed was all the optimism was gone. The optimism of the first two books was gone. Now, she still made a prediction. Her prediction in the third book is that we're so used to living online. We're so used to living vicariously through these glowing rectangles. We're so used to having all of our relationships mediated by smart devices and kind of being on the internet that we're at a breaking point. And the breaking point is, is are we actually going to be able to relate to people or are we gonna choose artificial intelligence as our relation. Now, this is where it kind of gets crazy, the idea of companion robots and sex robots and that sort of thing, unless you're paying attention. Because if you're paying attention just in the last year, the amount of chatter and the amount of news reports about how influential artificial intelligence is in our lives has just kind of gone through the roof. I mean, think about how much time you spend talking to machines these days. There was a terrific opening monologue on Saturday Night Live a couple months ago where the, uh, uh, the comedian said, do you know how much time we spend proving to robots that we're not robots? I mean, it's really funny when you think about it. I mean, how many times you're on a website, I'm not a robot. You're talking to a robot while you're doing that. It's just such a common part of life. Now, that's just kind of the extreme level of it. But Turkle says that the most the most common thing she hears from this generation is I'd rather text than talk. I'd rather text than talk. And the reason isn't because it's more convenient. The reason is because it's more controlled. It's safer. Employers tell us that this generation doesn't know how to read nonverbal communication. Tell us that this generation doesn't know how to look people in the eye. In other words, we live in a culture in which our, our, our cultural realities of technology are actually shifting the way that we do relationships. And, and this is huge. And the, the, the kind of the first undercurrent, it was our ability to find truth. And the second undercurrent, it's our ability to relate to one another. So what's the antidote? If the antidote for living in an age of information is discernment, the antidote for living in, in, in a world of kind of constant devices and mediated relationships, and, and this isn't gonna sound all that significant. I had a buddy in Tennessee where I used to live who used to say, hey man, this ain't rocket surgery. And this is kind of what this sounds like to me. This ain't rocket surgery. It's just relationships. It's just getting good at relationships. Can I challenge all of us to spend a lot more time in Proverbs? And here's the reason. Christianity has a great book of wisdom. 
In fact, all, most religions have a book of wisdom, but most of these other religions, if you look at their book of wisdom, it's kind of this esoteric nonsense that says stuff without saying stuff. Proverbs is brilliant because it's so practical, like don't talk loudly early in the morning. Amen, amen, that's brilliant, right? Don't marry a cantankerous woman. That's brilliant, yes, this is all really important stuff. But the other thing that Proverbs talks about over and over and over is the significance of eye contact, of just the countenance, of how much of the soul is revealed in the face. You know, it, 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 there's just, here, here's, an, you know, in our cultural moment, a soft answer turns away wrath. One of the epidemics of our society is because we're so, uh, uh, we're having so many of our relationships mediated, we feel like we can say whatever we want. When you look somebody in the eye, it's a lot harder to say whatever you want. And Proverbs tells you how to do it. A soft answer turns away wrath. In this particular cultural moment, I mean, that's like gold, right? I mean, that's like a breakthrough that a lot of us have not even remembered or thought through. So relationships are, 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 are huge. And I, and, and I would encourage you in your children's ministries and your family ministries as you train mom and dads to work with kids, prioritize eye contact. I know it sounds simple. I do. I get it but it is one of the most countercultural things you can teach the next generation to do. Well, let me go to a third undercurrent quickly. Uh, the third undercurrent I'll, I, I, I will call perpetual adolescence. Now, what I mean by perpetual adolescence is, is simply this. I first came across this concept uh, in a book called The Death of the Grown-Up. The opening line of this book was, uh, there was a time literally when there were no teenagers. Now, of course, Diane West, who wrote the book, is not saying that there was ever a time when there was no one teenaged. Just that throughout most of history, being a teenager wasn't a thing. Being a kid was a thing. Being an adult was a thing. And then there was these kind of rites of passage that happened oftentimes in families or communities that went, uh, that took a kid from being a kid to being an adult. But adolescence is quite recent. In fact, Diane West blames it on Chubby Checker. Um, you know, she blames it on the twist because that was the first dance that was unique to the student. Prior to that, kids would go to the adult dances and dress like the adults and dance like the adults. And so there was this idea of growing up. And then Chubby Checker gave the students their own dance. And then there was the automobile revolution, which now, you, you know, the parents weren't even at the dance. The kids went to their own dances. And then, of course, there was this group of people called advertisers who realized there's a lot of money to be made in this market demographic. And poof. You have this social construct, which is adolescence. It actually isn't something you see in other parts of the world. For example, if you saw the movie uh, Captain Phillips with Tom Hanks, talking about that um, pirate incident, you know, with the Somali pirates, the captain of the Somali pirate ship was 16 years old. Now, I'm not saying we should raise a generation of pirate captains, but I am saying that's a lot different than a group of people who spend 10 hours a day on Fortnite, right? I mean, it's just a completely different world. The idea of perpetual adolescence is adolescence now has not only become a part of life and culture, it's actually become in many ways the goal of culture. Kids are becoming adolescents earlier and earlier and earlier, and they're leaving it later and later and later. And we actually see an epidemic of parents and so on trying to get back to adolescence. You know, when I was growing up in the golden age of cinema, you know, the 80s, um, you know, the knuckleheads in the movies were like Ferris Bueller, Marty McFly, teenagers, you know. And then when I went to college, the knuckleheads went to college, right? Chris Farley and Adam Sandler. And who are the knuckleheads today? It's married men and women with kids, right? All the hangover movies and, you know, horrible bosses and, you know, bad moms. And in other words, you see in our culture a reflection of this idea of perpetual adolescence. In fact, adolescence is no longer even scientifically considered to be kind of a stage of life between 13 and 18. Uh, most sociologists will put adolescence as the stage of life between 11 and 30. There's a phrase for this. It's called failure to launch. Now, here's my, my, my take on this. One of the great, uh, I think, I don't want to put it, one of the great disappointments of an age of adolescence is that it penalizes younger generations with low expectations. And I think this completely undermines what we see in the scriptures as what God created them for. As, as I hope we all know and as I hope we all teach, if all students think Christianity is, is what we're saved from or what we're not supposed to do, 
that's not a worldview or a set of deep convictions that will last because there's better things on offer out in the culture oftentimes, at least in their own minds. But that's not what Christianity is. I mean, Jesus said, I came that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. That was part of this large redemptive narrative that begins with God taking the keys to creation and throwing them to Adam and Eve and saying, now make something of it. The Christian life is big and full and robust. It's beautiful. And if we embrace the low expectations of our culture, uh, then we're setting them up for failure. We're setting them up for a life of perpetual distraction. We're setting them up to become deeply, uh, 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 deeply embedded narcissists. We're setting them up to look for solutions to their meaninglessness from substances and, and that sort of stuff. See, all of this is the undercurrent, the so-called deaths from despair that we see. We talked about those earlier as one of the cultural waves. That's all a reflection of a culture of low expectations. So what's the antidote? If the antidote for the age of information is discernment, and the antidote for living in kind of this technocratic age is, is authentic relationships, the antidote for low expectations is simple. It's high expectations. It's high expectations. Treat them like humans. Treat them like growing humans. Offer responsibility. Let's not dumb down the Bible lesson as if they can't understand it and if they can't read. Let's challenge them in a way that fits with their God-given dignity as he made them in the image and likeness of God. I think they'll surprise us. I'm convinced by that. Well, let me get to the, the fourth undercurrent. And if I can say it, I, I think it might actually be the most dramatic, maybe the most important to understand, to really understand the cultural forces, especially those issues that are, I think, so front and center in our minds and our intention. And of course, that has to do with issues of sexual orientation, gender identity, family, and so on. Those are the ones, th those are the cultural waves that we're feeling most acutely. But there's a source for these waves. There's an undercurrent that created these waves that we've got to understand. And I'll call it identity after Christianity. Identity after Christianity. Let me give you the punchline, then I'm gonna give you an illustration, and then we'll try to make some sense of it. The punchline is this. It's easy to look at the major cultural changes that we've seen in our world and to think that it has been a moral shift. In other words, things that were once considered wrong are now considered right. Things that were once considered right are now considered wrong. Now, of course, that's observably true. That has happened, right? For better or for worse, there have been moral shifts in our culture. But my point is that the moral shifts are the effect, not the cause. It's the, uh, the fruit, not the root. Beneath the moral shift, there's been a more fundamental shift, and it's a shift of identity. Or to use a big polysyllabic word, it's a shift of anthropology, what it means to be human. Let me give you an illustration. I know there's no evidence of it uh, at this point in my life, but at one time I was a basketball player, and I played basketball in high school and college, so I still love the game. Uh, several years ago, there was a big story uh, that made national and international headlines. It had to do with Jason Collins. Uh, the story came out of uh, an article in Sports Illustrated, cover article in Sports Illustrated that went by the title, I'm black, I'm gay, and I'm in the NBA. And in that article, Jason Collins became the first male athlete still active in one of the big U.S. team sports to announce that he was a gay man. It had happened in the WNBA. It had happened as a kind of individual Greg Luganis and so on. But it hadn't happened in one of the big sports by someone who was still active. Um, and it was a fascinating article. Um, you know, he said that he uh, was a gay man, that he lived a gay lifestyle. In the middle of it, interestingly enough, he also said that he was a Christian and that as a Christian, he believed that Jesus, you know, loved everyone and tolerated and accepted everyone so that Jesus wouldn't have a problem with his lifestyle and so on and so on. Now, look, uh, if you've been around locker room culture enough, you know that that probably took a good bit of courage, especially at that point in history, for him to kind of come out and say that. Uh, but it was a really revealing part of our culture that the backlash that he expected didn't happen. He got support. He got tons of support from current NBA players, from past NBA legends. Michelle Obama tweeted her support, the first lady at the time. President Obama picked up the phone and called him and congratulated him on that. And what you hear when someone makes an announcement like that, it, it, you know, usually it's something like this. Finally, he can just be himself. He no longer has to hide who he is. 
Now, later on that day, after that announcement uh, came out, I was watching ESPN. show was um, uh, Outside the Lines, which is a show that deals with controversial sports issues. And the guest host there was a guy named Chris Broussard. And Chris is a great NBA analyst. He's one of my favorites. He really knows the game. He's a lot of fun. Uh, but he's also pretty well known to be a Christian. And so as he's being asked about this story, uh, you know, they're asking him pretty legitimate questions like, you know, is this going to affect Jason Collins' career prospects? Does that mean other teams are going to sign him or not sign him? Uh, are other players going to come out? I mean, these are legitimate sports-related issues, you know, for sports nuts like, you know, like me. But then the host asked him something a little bit different. He said, hey, Chris, you're a Christian too. And in the article, Jason not only said that he was a gay man, but he said he was a Christian. Are you okay with that, Chris? Can you be a gay Christian, Chris? Can you imagine being asked that on national television? What do you say? Well, Chris, to his credit, without a whole lot of prep, clearly taken off guard, said, well, as a Christian, I believe that God created sex between a man and a woman for marriage. And anything other than that, whether it's heterosexual, homosexual, would be a sin. Now, you can imagine how people responded to that. I mean, they called for his firing. They called for his, you know, resignation. They called for his head on a platter. I mean, you know, it, it, was, it was just violent uh, how, how mad that they were. You can't say that on TV. You can't say that on TV. Of course, they accused him of hating Jason Collins, which if you actually look at his statement, I'm pretty sure he condemned the sexual behavior of pretty much the entire NBA with that statement. But anyway, um, what Chris Broussard was told is, you have to keep views like that to yourself. You can't say that out loud. You have to keep views like that to yourself. And they said, John, what's all this got to do with identity after Christianity and undercurrents and my students on a daily basis? That story reveals a fundamental shift. Now, I'm going to have to get a little nerdy here on you, but, but hang with me. Western civilization uh, has been the dominant civilization in history for a long time. It's made up of a lot of different forces, a lot of different ideological uh, influences, whether you're talking about the Christian influence or the, you know, the secular enlightenment influence, or you're talking about kind of the Greco-Roman, you know, headwaters or any of that sort of stuff. And so very diverse, but one of the commonalities of all these idea patterns is that what it means to be human has long been considered in Western civilization to be the sorts of people who ask these big questions about life in the world and our behavior is on the side. In other words, we would ask questions like, is there a God and is there truth? And what's right and wrong and how do we know? Now, it's not that we agreed on these answers. We disagreed you know, vehemently on these answers, right? You know, the secularists would answer these questions one way and the Christians would answer them the other way. But the point is, is that the fundamental understanding of what it means to be human is that we're the sorts of creatures who ask these big metaphysical questions and however we answer them determines our behavior. But let's go back to the Chris Broussard, Jason Collins incident. Because in the pages of Sports Illustrated, Jason Collins makes an announcement about his behavior. And he's told that's who he is. Chris Broussard makes a metaphysical observation about what's right and wrong and who decides, and he's told you have to keep that view to yourself. Do you see how things have changed? Do you see the exchange? That's been the most dramatic shift in our culture, is that the shifts that we've seen haven't just been on our, what we think is right and what we think is wrong. We've shifted in what we think it means to be a human being per se, so that the moment our kids are born into this world, until the moment they die, unless there's some other dramatic shift that takes it a different direction. Our kids will hear from every different source in a million different ways, the single common thing that the most fundamental thing about them are their sexual urges and their internal sense of who they are. That that's more important than their biology, that's more important than if they're created or not, that the single most important thing is about them is their sexual inclinations and choices. That's the defining aspect, that it's not a behavior on the side, it's a fundamental thing about who they are. And that dramatically disagrees with the biblical account. Now look, I, I know, I know, we're tired of this conversation. I do a daily radio commentary uh, that gets sent uh, you know, out on email and everything else five days a week. I'm so tired of talking about sex, I can't tell you, but it is the single dominant thing that we think about in our culture. We think that educational policy 
We think that something as fundamental as restrooms, all of these things have to be flipped on their head to accommodate a new way of thinking. And it is a new way of thinking on every level. There's a lot more about that in the book. When you think about things like same-sex marriage, homosexuality has been around for a long time. Same-sex marriage started yesterday, culturally speaking. These are huge challenges in our culture, but they're not just surface level challenges. We're talking about the ground beneath our feet has shifted and what we think is true, what we think is real, and who we think we are. Now, I got good news. Um, well, two pieces of good news. The first piece of good news is that vision of what it means to be human is small. It's sad. It's shriveled up. And the second piece of good news is we've got a much better answer about what it means to be human than anything that's on the market right now. I'm telling you, the Christian vision of what it means to be human is that every single person from the moment of conception to the moment of natural death is made in the image and likeness of God, that they are designed, that their, that their non-physical components and their physical components have been embedded and endowed with dignity, that of all the living things on the planet, there is an authority and a blessing given to humans that animals don't share. And this, this is different than what they're going to hear in science class. This is different than what they're going to hear in, in, in their sociology classes. This is different than what they're going to get on cartoons and what they're going to hear from, you know, hear from messages and culture from, you know, social media postings to commercials or whatever. This is where the church has a wonderful antidote. So this last very significant cultural shift, and by the way, it impacts the church because if we don't know who we are as human, what does it mean to be a Christian? We don't know who we are as human. What does it mean to be saved? Saved from what? Saved to what? And by the way, the biblical narrative doesn't start with we're sinners. It starts with we're made in the image and likeness of God. That's why sin's a big deal. That's why salvation is described in all these rewords like restore, renew, redeem, resurrect, reconcile. We're actually being made new again to what God intended. And so this question of identity is huge. And the antidote is the image of God. Now quickly, I think we could go from church to church to church. And I'd say, hey, everybody, fill in the blank. Humans are made, and everyone would say, in the image of God. And then I'd say, well, what is the image of God? How is that different than what people think today? What difference will that make in our families? What difference does that make in terms of our work? What difference does that make in terms of leisure and family? And I think you hear a lot more crickets. Well, we spend a lot of time on that understanding of the image of God in A Practical Guide to Culture because we want you to be able to not only tell kids that they're sinners, which by the way, you still gotta do that. We want you to be able to teach them who they are is made in the image of God because only by knowing what our identity is in creation are we really gonna be able to be settled in our identity in Christ as followers of Jesus. And that's true for us as adults it's true for our families, and it's definitely true of the next generation. I so appreciate what you guys do on a daily basis, putting your necks, your energy, your paychecks, and your lives on the line for the next generation. That's one of the other great things about Christianity. It's multi-generational. We follow Jesus to teach other generations to follow Jesus so that they'll teach other generations to follow Jesus. You see that really clearly in Paul's language. Well, that probably felt a little bit like drinking from a fire hydrant. Hopefully it wasn't too much information overload, especially since that was the first uh, undercurrent anyway. Uh, but let me give you a couple questions that you can now take and kind of wrestle with. Uh, the, the, the first question I, I think is, is trying to kind of get our minds around this idea of information and technology that, that we all kind of have to deal with. Uh, and, and that is this, where do you see the opportunities of technology to impact families in the next generation? And where are the threats? I think we gotta discern what are the opportunities and threats? Because we're not against technology. We're not gonna rid the world of technology, but how do we use it without being captivated by it? That's the question. Uh, the second question uh, re really wrestles with that whole idea of high expectations. Um, what expectations do, do the scriptures put on followers of Jesus? And how would that translate to a younger generation? So if we can clarify what expectations there are for followers of Jesus, 
Paul talks about this throughout you know, his epistles. Jesus himself had expectations that he put on those who would follow him. What does that look like to translate that down 10 or 12 years uh, to children? Uh, so that's the second question. And, and, and then the final question, um, how do the scriptures describe the purpose of human beings and the identity of human beings? How did the scriptures decide it? Um, one of the kind of the catchwords that's kind of in our church culture right now is identity in Christ, identity in Christ. But I don't think we can know what identity in Christ is if we don't know what God created us for in the garden. In other words, this isn't a different identity than being human. He's fixing it. He's restoring it. He's renewing it. So what's that? Let's wrestle with that a little bit as well. 